My name is Maureen Conway. I am Vice President for Policy Programs at the Aspen Institute and Executive Director of our Economic Opportunities Program. Uh, really delighted to have you today to, uh, to join us to talk with Richard Reeves about his, his new book. I hope you saw them for sale outside. Uh, Dream Hoarders, how the, middle upper, how the American Upper Middle Class is Leaving Everyone Else in the Dust, Why That's a Problem, and What to Do About It. Um, at the Economic Opportunities Program, we, uh, we work to advance promising policy strategies and ideas to help uh, low and moderate income Americans connect to opportunity and thrive in today's changing economy. And as part of that work, we run this Working in America series. In the Working America series, we've, um, we've talked about a wide range of issues uh, affecting working Americans today. Uh, we've brought a variety of different people and perspectives to these conversations, people from business, uh, from labor, leaders from uh, different communities across the country, educators, journalists, philanthropists, uh, policymakers, and others uh, to talk about the issues that they see affecting working Americans today um, and what are some ideas for addressing these issues. We've covered a variety of topics from uh, minimum wage to technology, new forms of work, child care, paid leave, and more. If you are just joining us, I welcome you to go browse our website uh, at as.pn slash working in America, and you can see our previous events. Um, on that note, that means we are also recording today's event. So um, uh, please do be mindful of that, and uh, please do silence your phones. Um, but you are welcome to uh, tweet about today's event, and our hashtag is TalkGoodJobs. Um, today's conversation, we have the opportunity to uh, uh, to to talk about a, a bigger picture uh, idea around the state of the American dream. And if we think about the American dream, you know, really this is a good fit for our Working in America series because the American dream really very much relates to work, right? It has this idea of if you work hard, you achieve the American dream. And the theme throughout our Working in America conversations is what will it take working in Americans to support themselves through their work and to feel confident that the American dream is still open and available to them. Uh, so I'm, so this book, uh, when I first saw it, I, I, uh, I, I emailed Richard right away and I said, would you please come chat with us about it because I think that this would be a really terrific fit for so many of the issues that we've been uh, talking about. So thank you so much for joining us thank and you. welcome. And uh, just uh, one more note of thanks before I start. I do also want to um, thank our funders for this uh, Working in America series. We're so grateful to uh, the Prudential Foundation, to the Ford Foundation, to the uh, Walmart Foundation and to the Serdina Foundation who are great thought partners and supporters of our work here and we could not do this without them. Um, so Richard Rees is a Brookings Institution Senior Fellow in Economic Studies, a Policy Director of Brookings Center on Children and Families and Editor-in-Chief of its Social Mobility Memos blog and he also teaches a bit at Georgetown. Uh, there's more information about him in the bio and your materials. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about them, but uh, thank you so much, Richard, for thank joining us me. today, and welcome. Thank you, Maureen. Um, and so let's start. Let's talk about about this book. Uh, this book, by the way, it's a great book. I've written all over mine, so I do uh, highly recommend it. Um, why, let's just talk about why, why did you write it? Uh, what, maybe you could say a little bit about why you wrote it, why you framed it around this American idea, American dream, and what that ideal actually means to you and how that frames your book. Well, uh, the first thing to say is I think it's probably because I'm a new American. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that, that's probably obvious to you by now, even if you didn't already know it, that I come from, <laughs> I come from a country that knows a bit about social class. Uh, and I kind of grew up uh, actually kind of very aware of the role of class in the mm -hmm. society that, that I was in. Um, before I go any further, though, whenever I see an audience of this size, I always feel the need to ask people whether any of you are here thinking you're going to see the other Richard Reeves. <laughs> <laughs> the famous one, one. I mean, no, no shame at all. Yeah, two, three. That probably means that that's half of you, and three of you have been brave enough to kind of say. So uh, you are free to leave without any, any shame whatsoever. I completely understand. It happens to me. It happens a lot. Um, on the other hand, if you stay, uh, sometimes uh, the people who came thinking they were going to hear the other Richard Reeves ended up buying my book, so who knows what happened. <laughs> we do occasionally get uh, mistaken for each other in, in ways that are very often humorous, um, which we can get into if there's time. So I grew up uh, in the UK. I'm now an a US citizen. 
uh, and I work on issues of inequality and intergenerational mobility, the, the American dream, if you like. Uh, and uh, in a way, there's a bit of a personal side to the story, which is because I grew up sort of so aware of class. And actually, I talk a bit about this in the book, which is that my mother, who left high school very early, was from a from a rural background, uh, used to threaten us growing up with elocution lessons. Uh, we called them electrocution lessons. We thought it would be kind of funny because uh, we grew up in a working class town and we were starting to drop our T's. We were starting to say computer and butter and better. Uh, and of course, she thought but that would I be. I was wondering how you said but, computer com without well, a T. Well, to do it without a P or a T is really hard. It's <laughs> commuter. Commuter. Uh, and the f I said that, and I, she literally just all the color drained from her face. <laughs> And uh, she also, uh, so she, was, she didn't actually then do that, but she was very concerned about it. Went to a very ordinary high school in an ordinary town. She wanted us to be able to rise and thought that how we spoke or what fork we used um, would just get in the way or whether we could dance. So she f made us go to ballroom dancing lessons. So I spent a miserable year of my life every Saturday morning <laughs> learning how to dance. Uh, to do a waltz. I've still got a decent cha-cha for those who want to try me later. <laughs> because, again, she was convinced that we were going to get to some job and there was going to be a work, a work event, an Aspen Institute dance. Uh, it uh, happened. Uh, <laughs> and my failure to waltz properly was going to mean you didn't hire me. All right. uh, that would be it, you know. Um, I'll let uh, Walter know you can show up at our dances. <laughs> I, was just, I was just at home last weekend. I was in the UK and uh, The Observer published an extract of my book which mentioned the ballroom dancing thing. My mother said, I never made you go to ballroom dancing lessons. I said, yes, you did. I vividly remember it. No, no, I didn't. So we ended up rummaging through the boxes in my old bedroom to find the certificates for level one waltz or whatever. So I had the evidence that she did, in fact, do it. And I spent my whole life trying to escape from that in my policy work and a lot of the work I did kind of in government and out in think tanks. It was really kind of in against, kind of against the, rigid, the rigidities of a class-bound society, a society where we know too much about where you're going to end up, given where you started from. And then moving to the US uh, and kind of discovering both through my research but also through my kind of personal uh, observations that the class system in the US mm -hmm. operates, um, in my view, every bit as efficiently as the one in the UK, in many ways more efficiently, more ruthlessly efficiently, and especially at the top, and especially when it comes to protecting the status of the upper middle class, those at the top of society. But it does so under a veneer of classlessness. Mm -hmm. So unlike the UK that's saturated in class consciousness, we're constantly calibrating people's class position. Here there's this kind of sense of it's a meritocracy, it's classless, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I look at the zoning, the way you zone your neighborhoods, the way you fund schools, the way school admissions works, the way the tax subsidies work, I mean. And then I look at the perpetuation at the top. That looks like a class society to me. That looks like a society where social class is doing kind of a lot of work. And then there was a kind of particular moment which we may get onto when uh, mm -hmm. President Obama tried to take away one of our precious tax breaks. And that was the light bulb moment for me. It's like, okay, I have to write about these people. And by these people, I meant me uh -huh. and almost everybody that I know. Right. So, so you, are, you are an American now. Yeah. Um, you are a citizen. And uh, so uh, maybe you now also call yourself uh, middle class. Um, <laughs> or upper middle class. I, I, I appreciated that you gave us the more palatable upper middle class designation, and uh, although although your headline writer outed us as rich, rich yeah. um, <laughs> in the New York Times. Yeah. Um, um, but 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 talk about. I mean, you know, you sort of framed this this in the book a little bit as as really it's it's. It's not just about the top one percent, right? There are so many people who are, in fact, rich who, or upper middle class right. um, who aren't really cognizant of their advantages. So, so talk a little bit about how you see, you know, what is it that you see in your research that sort of shows you these class divides, and just characterize a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. sort of what you see in the data mm -hmm. about about what these class divides look like and and how they've emerged over time. So, obviously. Class is a very malleable concept, and as you've said, you know, people you, in the U.S. most people define themselves as middle class, which makes it kind of a, a, even a harder concept to grasp. Which is why I think upper middle class is a better way to think about it, because it kind of breaks out the sort of group at the top 15 or 20 percent at the top. Uh, it's not just about economics; it's about education, it's about family, it's about uh, all kinds of things. But just to focus on income for a moment, um, my reading of 
uh, economic trends. And when I, when I say my reading of economic trends, I mean my reading of Gary Burtless's reading of economic <laughs> trends or other colleagues' reading of it, is that really the actions towards the top, so there hasn't been much in, really in any increase in income inequality in the bottom 80% in the last 30, 40 years. So the, kind of, the, the shape of the, of the income, it looks broadly similar today for the bottom 80 as it did before. But then you start to see this pulling away happening uh, at the, the top quintile, top 20%. And then, of course, as you get more towards the top, then you can see that it gets stronger. The elastic stretches kind of even more. But it's, if you're looking for a point at which, say, from about 1980 onwards, when we did see this increase in economic inequality, where in the distribution does it take place? And it's not just at the 99th percentile. So it's not just a we are the 99% story. You can point to the top 1% and see these huge stratospheric gains. Usually you have to change the left-hand axis on your chart, of course, <laughs> uh, which makes it look even more dramatic. Um, and so, and it's, that's certainly true, although there's quite a lot of movement in and out of that top 1%, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a fixed group like any of these. None of these groups are fixed. But also, actually, the, the top fifth have done pretty well. So they may not have done as well as the top 1%, but if you're looking for a kind of group, where's the line between the people that have kind of been doing progressively better? It is I think much broader than the top 1%. It's not to say there isn't an issue with the top 1%. I mean, I've been criticized for being exculpatory of the top 1%. And that's not the case if you read the book. I think there's a lot that we can do to tax the top mm -hmm. 1% more and so on. And I'm very worried about the influence of money in politics, although it wasn't my subject. Um, but I think that it's just too easy to only look up. Mm -hmm. I think it's too easy for someone on the 95th percentile, someone who's on you know, 250,000 a year or you know, income, whatever, to just say, yeah, but I'm not rich. Mm -hmm. It's those people up there that are rich. Um, and I think I quote this statistic in the book, that a third of the people on one of the Occupy Wall Street um, marches had six-figure uh, earnings. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is you've got a bunch of people who are, by any kind of reasonable definition of the income distribution, doing pretty well, and I think increasingly well over time, but have been convinced one way or the other that, that actually it's just the rich that are the problem, and they are never rich themselves. And in a way, that's an abdication, because then that allows them to just constantly say, yes, we should tax the rich more, but I'm not rich. And that just keeps happening all the way up the distribution. And uh, I think that to the extent that we've tried that as a political strategy, it hasn't really worked. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's time for a more honest conversation about the fact that there are more people than just the top 1% doing pretty well. And that's, as I say, that's my interpretation of roughly where you see this fracture point yeah. Uh, taking, uh, opening up in, in the income distribution. Yeah. So 1980 around is roughly where you characterize the fracture point happening. And just say, I mean, we can probably debate this, and people do debate this forever, right, why this happened. But maybe just say a couple of things that sort of stick out for you as to why that's the point or, or what was going on that, that we started to see this divide then. Sure, and again, I'm always conscious as I look around the room that there are other people <laughs> in the audience who study this more closely than I do. But uh, the sort of shorthand that I use in the book is uh, wages and wives. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is that the increase in earnings inequality is a big part of this story around the increase in income inequality. Most people still get most of their income through earnings. And so if you see this kind of increase in the earnings distribution, which we do with those at the top, particularly those with college education, so doing quite well uh, and pulling away, that's obviously almost inevitably going to have an effect on the household income distribution. But then the wives' point is that we now see, with the massive expansion in women's education and with the rising uh, earnings for women, still not on a par with men, but nonetheless significantly higher than they were 30, 40 years ago, um, what we ne then you can see is it's just not just one college graduate in a household, but it's two. Um, partly through a process that's very unromantically labelled assortative mating <laughs> by sociologists, which is the tendency of people to marry people like themselves. Uh, and so you kind of put the, all those factors together, which is you've now got women as well as men who are kind of college educated and, well, earning, and earning well, and an increase in earnings inequality, put them together. And I think that that accounts for a significant amount of the increase in income inequality. Yeah, well, at least you didn't <laughs> say we were utility maximizing in our dating. So you know, I didn't, could have, it could have been worse. Could have been even worse. Yeah, people have said that, but uh, I didn't. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so, so you call, you call the, I mean, you call this uh, dream hoarding, and I think one of the things you know on this sort of family structure thing, I think one of the things that you also sort of usefully do in the book is is you distinguish between this idea of dream hoarding and good parenting, yeah. um, and you know, and I think that sort of the way that we, you know, I think I think that this is an important distinction to sort of paint the picture up a, a little bit as we get into sort of the, the what we, you know, 
why do we have this problem? What, what are good behaviors and what yes. are maybe less good behaviors? Yeah, I mean, it's one of the things that I've struggled most with uh, in the book and in my thinking about this generally, which is where is that line between wanting to do the best for your kids and wanting people to want to do the best for their kids and to be rewarded and praised mm -hmm. for doing so, um, and a point at which you're using your position your economic or social or political position to, in a sense, rig the contest in your kids' favour. Mm -hmm. And so it's one thing to want your kids to do well in the contest by helping them prepare well for it. It's another to just leave nothing to try and start rigging, rigging it. So an analogy that I use, because someone told me you have to use sporting metaphors in the US, has to have sporting <laughs> metaphors. I don't know if that's true in this room, but um, I can contrast a, uh, a parent, a, say a father, um, for the purpose of the art, a father who helps his daughter to get on the softball team by practicing every night with her mm -hmm. um, after, after work, throwing the ball at her. There's probably a better word for it than that. But, uh, so I'm not, I'm not fully American yet, but <laughs> pitching. <laughs> Pitching. Don't look at me. I make oh, okay, my fine, sports right, metaphors. Right, yeah. so. uh, and so as a result, she gets really good at pitch catching, uh, or whatever, uh, and, gets on the, and, get, and gets on the team. All right? Uh, gets on the team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Easier than I thought. Thank you. Thank catch. Gets on the team. And you'd say, great, good parenting, invested in it, lots of skills, etc. Gets on the team fair and square. Then you get another parent that gives the coach $100 uh, and says, OK, here's $100. Can you get my daughter on the team? As a result, which she gets on the team, even though she's not really good enough to get on the team. We have a hugely different moral response to those two stories, don't we? Um, very good for the first, bad for the second. Why? Because that's not fair. Because they've used their economic position, but the parents given something up in both cases, time in the first place, money in the second place. Um, they've, they've wanted a good outcome for their kids, which is to get on the baseball team. But actually what you think is, no, 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 because the parents who can't bribe their thing or think it's wrong to bribe their way into it. So it's an it's a extreme example, but it's a way to get, have a thought experiment about that there is a line. There is, just because a line's difficult to draw about when good parenting blurs into opportunity hoarding, doesn't mean that the line doesn't exist. And that line is in different places, at different times, in different societies. So we know it can move. And in particular, the social norms around certain kinds of behavior, like the bribing one. There are other societies where people would say, it's fine, if you've got $100, that's okay, <laughs> right? Not here, now. Right. But maybe it was here, maybe it will be here, okay here in 50 years or whatever. Maybe your kid having a, step, uh, a head start getting into a college because you went there through legacy preferences. That was okay in the UK in the early 20th century. It's definitely not now. It's still okay here, even though it wasn't okay here in the 19th century. So you see how these kind of the social norms about what's acceptable does change. And I'm just trying to get us to just personally, as much as politically, just think really hard about where those lines are uh, and at what point we stop. Yeah, and one of the things I was thinking about with where what changes those norms is, you know, back to sort of what we were talking about earlier in terms of the widening divides, right? So if you think about sort of being a parent and, you know, raising your kids to be the best that kids they can be and hopefully going out and getting a job and getting a job that will, you know, earn a good living, and there's a shrinking set of jobs that actually earn a good living, and so now if I, if I fall... That fall is so much for, further, right? I think you know maybe that moves the incentive structure to to think about well, you know, what, yeah. when I'm trading off my bribing the coach versus my child will never have a bad, you know, have an opportunity in life, like, right? Like maybe the maybe I feel okay about bribing because my first responsibility is to take care of my kids. Yeah. So how how do we how do we how do we think about you know sort of the incentive structure that these widening runs? wrongs set up yeah, and great, how, should, how should that It's a great that? question. I think this point about incentives is, is an important one. And it's one of the ways I think that income inequality relates itself to these kinds of uh, these sorts of mechanisms. Because if you do have growing income inequality, and in particular in the US between the top and the middle, uh, then it looks like a long way down. Mm -hmm. uh, if you also have a society where money really matters a lot for access to health care and education and so on, then the costs of having less money are obviously higher. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you're a parent, as I am, and you're looking at it, and you're looking and you're at the top, it doesn't, doesn't look great down there for your kids. And so if, if you think that, if you come to fear the fall, I mean, no one's going to be in favor of downward mobility. Maybe we'll get onto that. Yeah. Spectacularly unpopular idea. Um, uh, although I'm in favor of it, uh, as I say in the book. I just haven't decided which kid yet. Just, <laughs> think I, I, think, I think I know. You know who you are. Um, but uh, uh, the... So the idea of it, kind of, it's, it's difficult, but I think to some extent, actually, if you have this uh, fear that's going to be a long way down and the stakes are so high, 
Mm -hmm. That's what I observe, is that upper middle class parents feel like the stakes are very, very high. When the stakes feel very high, you in, you're very highly incentivized to do pretty much anything and everything, uh, particularly if everyone else is doing it, mm -hmm. uh, to ensure your kids don't fall, to put a glass floor underneath them, to kind of make sure they don't kind of come down. That, if it's successful, <laughs> will mean that inequality will increase further. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll have less intergenerational mobility. And if, incre and if inequality increases further, then your incentives to make sure your kids don't fall get even greater. And if they get even greater, you'll work even harder to do it. And, if you also, and so then you're in a danger of really vicious, a real vicious circle where, in, where the incentives to hoard opportunity mm -hmm. uh, and income inequality kind of ratchet up together. Uh, and you obviously want to attack it both, uh, both sides. But it does seem to me it's a reasonable thing to say, let's lower the stakes a bit. Let's make the fear of the fall a bit less. Maybe that'll take a bit of the heat out of this because it does feel as if people feel like the stakes are very high indeed. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't be that high. Right. You know, dropping right. a few, qu dropping a couple of quintiles shouldn't feel like the end of the world, but it really does. Yeah, it really, it really, it really does, and I think that this is a huge problem. And I've had, um, and we can talk about this downward mobility because I've had this same uh, conversation with people that, that it seems like you've had, where where everybody wants to talk about how do we how do we encourage upward mobility and how do we how do we help people at the bottom move up? And then you say, well, if the people at the bottom move up, that means somebody at the top has to move down. Yeah. That's just sort of the mathematical <laughs> fact of the that's matter. to say that bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, that's when they change the subject. No, no. So, no, no. no so, every politician you have to do that with. So I've worked with a number of politicians, and you do the if you're doing relative mobility, you do the quintiles, so moving people up, and you say, look how many people are stuck at the bottom and how few make it to the top. Go, that's terrible. We've got to hugely increase the number of people moving up into that top 20%. You say, great, and you have a policy discussion. About it. And you say, of course, that means that more people will come out of the free falling down. And they go, what? Go, no, no, what? <laughs> they're the people that vote for me. Um, uh, so from a relative point of view, that's true. Of course, if you've got more absolute mobility, if you've got more, if people are getting better off more generally, A, that lowers the stakes around it, mm -hmm. because even if you fall in relative terms, you're still doing pretty well by comparison to your um, parents, and you're creating more room at the top. Um, I think given current growth trajectory, I'm not confident we're going to mm -hmm. get huge absolute mobility in the next um, few years. Um, but it does. It is. It is a necessary fact that a kind of a healthy society that has you know movement uh, will have to see movement in both directions. And then the question is, if there isn't as much downward mobility as you might like, <laughs> in order to see more upward mobility, then look at why it's happening. And if, mm -hmm. if it's happening through means that are perfectly fair and mm -hmm. honourable, then that's one thing. If you start to think that some of it's a result of, system, of systemic and structural inequalities uh, and some rigging of the system in favour of those kids, then that's a different story. So I want to, before I turn to, to some of my other topics, I do want to sort of ask you to think about um, this question of, you know, essentially kind of pull it together a little bit about why is this a problem for all of us, right? Not just, right, why is, why is this dream hoarding a problem, not just for the people who can't access the dream because we're hoarding it, but why is it a, really kind of a problem for all of us kind of looking to our future economy and society? Well, I mean, I can give you... I can give you the sort of standard answer and then the honest answer if you want. Um, I mean, the standard answer is look, it's, in all, it's in all our benefit to have a more mobile society, lots of upward mobility. We'll get more economic dynamism because there'll be more people incentivized to grow and we'll have entrepreneurs at the top and, and so on. Um, and in the long run, that will benefit even those of us in, at the top um, because even if our, we don't do quite as well in the short run, in the long run, we're part of a more successful economy. Well, okay. That might all be true, and it's what everyone tends to say. Mm -hmm. The more honest answer is that I'm not sure that some of the things I think we should be doing are necessarily in the self-interest of the upper middle class at the top. Mm -hmm. I think they can quite plausibly say things look pretty good for us, mm -hmm. actually, and we'll keep all our tax breaks, and we'll keep it in our neighborhoods, and we'll, we don't like it out there. And I, It's not clear to them, to us, that necessarily giving more up and helping the bottom 80% is in my interest, actually. Um, so, yes, we can make the standard arguments, but I think at some point you've got to start saying, look, actually, this is partly about expecting people to do things that are not necessarily immediately in their own self-interest um, for the greater good, <laughs> because it's the right thing to do, uh, or maybe because they're afraid of their kids falling, right? So mm -hmm. maybe it comes back to this point about risk. If you, if you have more risk, you'll do that. But actually, I, I'm, I think the conversation needs to move on now to a bit more uh, an honest one, which is, look, rather than doing this usual thing, it'll benefit us all 
everyone's going to be better off, <laughs> it's win, 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 is to kind of say, you know what, it doesn't always work like that. Sometimes mm -hmm. social change does require some people to give up a little bit, mm -hmm. to lose a little bit, and right now that's us. Yeah, and, and, and is there also a timing thing, right? So it can, it, we can hang on to our advantages for a while, but is, is that really sustainable? Well, I don't know. Uh, I mean, you know, what is it? President Obama said his administration was the only thing standing between, he said to Wall Street, the, you and the pitchforks. Um, and so there is an argument that you know, at some point, you know, some of the, the basic economic and social and political infrastructure of a society won't, won't, won't be sustainable uh, with those levels of, of inequality. And that will, be bad for all, that will be bad for all of us. And the, the pitchforks, a lot of people think that they're going to be wielding the pitchforks. They might actually be on the sharp end of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the we are the 99% thing might not turn out to be as true as they think. And interesting, I think a lot of the anger you see now that's propelled some of the populism recently, it tends not to be at the rich, actually. It tends to be at the kind of professional upper middle class you know, mm -hmm. uh, folk. That's, right. that's where I, that my interpretation, it's, not, it's, it's drawing on other people's work, of course, is that you know, it's, a, it's a kind of quite class-based thing against kind of that, that particular group rather than necessarily the rich as such, who still, in some ways, are still unhelpfully reified mm -hmm. by, uh, you know, right. uh, by Americans. Yeah. So let's get into a little bit of some of the things you talk about as both kind of where this happens and, and where we might make improvements in our systems. And one is sort of around human capital development, right? And, mm -hmm. and we, when I say human capital development, probably most people think education. But you also, before, and we, we will definitely get into education and back to some of the issues you've already touched on. Um, but the other thing you also talk about is, is health, right? Mm -hmm. um, and parents, of course, play a big role in keeping their children healthy. Um, and, and being able to be uh, healthy is important in terms of being able to be a productive, contributing member of, of society. Um, so, so, and yet we're seeing some of these divides influence health uh -huh. as well. And so can you say a little bit about sort of um, how we're divided not only in economic terms but in health terms and maybe offer some ideas on what might we, how should we think about our health policy questions maybe a little differently than we do. I think we think about them too individually like health as a consumer. Group. But anyway. So I'm not sure I'll be able to. I don't feel confident enough probably to answer the policy okay. uh, questions of it, again, um, given my limits. But I, I think that the health inequalities we see are both symptom and cause of some of these kind of class uh, inequalities that we see. And again, um, work that Barry Bosworth and Gary actually have done on life expectancy is very real. I think life expectancy is a really good kind of uh, way of looking at what's happening. And you do see increased uh, inequality by class. Uh, income background, class back by for life expectancy, uh, people living kind of much longer. That has huge implications, of course, for the progressivity of the social security and social security system, and, and all kinds of other things. Um, it changes the equilibrium uh, if that carries on. That's a good sort of symptom. Um, but you also see that because health is a form of human capital, and Gary, Gary, uh, Gary Becker about that, um, the, uh, those of us who are in the upper middle class and have kind of kids invest quite heavily in our health. Mm. And it makes sense to do that because actually all the investments we're making in other forms of human capital, like education, really make most sense if you think you're going to live a long time or you're going to be healthy enough to enjoy the, the fruits of it. You know? And so actually it, it makes perfect. Well, and even kind of, if you don't have an education, you probably still want to live a long time. But anyway. Yeah, but if you're just being, I didn't say utility maximizing before, but it is. <laughs> Is actually, you know, it's it is it is true that you know, in terms of the return you're going to get on your investment in yourself, mm -hmm. in terms of being healthier, then that's going to be higher for someone who's higher earning and who's living longer. Whereas if your earnings are much lower anyway, uh, then actually, to this extent, the incentives around health are, are, are kind of lower. I do think it comes back to the risk point, and I said I'm not mm -hmm. going to get into policy because. The U.S. is bonkers on healthcare policy, uh, as, as is the U.K. By the way, that, but from completely different ends of the spectrum. You know, God forbid you touch the National Health Service uh -huh. in the U.K. It doesn't matter how right wing you are; Thatcher couldn't touch it, uh, basically. But here he's got the opposite problem. Um, but I do think that this I, this risk thing, right? Mm -hmm. Where's the risk? Right. How at risk am I of not having health care coverage? How at risk are my kids of not having health care coverage? And to the extent that it, that the risk uh, profile also follows class lines, I think that does have implications for health policy. Uh, and I'm very interested in issues of risk around education and health and so on. And the, the way that actually those of us who are in a position to can actually insulate ourselves and our kids pretty well from a lot of risk. It's not that we don't have those risks, we do. But boy, can we insure ourselves against them in one way or another, mm -hmm. uh, whereas others are kind of you know, genuinely afraid. And, that, and in, you, know, you now yeah. see you're worried about the risk of going to college. Right. People are really worried about health insurance. Mm -hmm. I, I think you can, I used to believe you knew, every, you could tell everything about America from the movie Jerry Maguire. And there's a, there's a scene in there where she goes with him to form his new agency. The first thing she asks him in the elevator is, will you have health insurance? 
<laughs> and as a European, you're watching it, what's she talking about? <laughs> First question she asks, will you have health insurance? But of course, if, if you're a worker in America, particularly in the middle, mm -hmm. you're really worried about that. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay, well, let's talk about education, because uh, you spent a lot of time talking about education. You talk about education both as the, as the I mean, I, I feel like you talk about education both as the system for us opportunity hoarding and as well as sort of we have this idea that it should be the uh, a more the opportunity to 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 show your merits um, and it but it doesn't work that way yeah but I think you also have ideas on how it can be better but let's first talk about what's the, what are the how how is that the, the system mm. by which we're opportunity hoarding right now well I think we should start by saying that human capital and skills have become more important, right? Mm -hmm. That's fill in the usual stuff you'd expect someone to say after that, right? If you're having a longer debate about human capital. So education therefore matters more. Quality education matters more. It matters from, the, from very early in life. It matters parenting in the very early years. You see kind of much more engaged and intensive parenting at the top of the distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously it matters through K-12 and it definitely matters in post-secondary. And there's this idea, I think Horace Mann's quote, that education is the great equalizer, the balance wheel mm -hmm. in the social machinery. Great equalizer, it's a great idea. Um, I'm a bit more with uh, my Georgetown colleague, Anthony Carnavali, who describes the uh, college system in the US uh, as a, uh, a mach an engine of inequality. Uh, and not necessarily it's not done in a malicious way, but the way that uh, K-12 is organized and funded, and in particular the way that we stratify uh, the post-secondary education system, it does actually serve to kind of cement those inequalities. Um, the US is very unusual uh, in the world in being a, a society where the gaps by social background at, twel at 12th grade aren't any narrower than they were at K. Uh, most other places in the world can at least go some way towards closing those gaps because we've got the kids then, right? So you'd think, you'd think public policy would do something then. It doesn't really work in the US. Actually, the UK is not great either. Um, it comes out pretty much the same as it went in. And then the post-secondary mm -hmm. system takes the inequality that is given and magnifies it because of the kind of way that there's a sorting. So four-year selective colleges, 70% of the kids are from the top 20%. Um, uh, and then you see kind of very significant underinvestment by comparison in community colleges, mm -hmm. which I think like the Cinderella of the uh, opportunity um, system. I think um, aching for more investment and higher quality teaching, plus the whole admissions process uh, around higher education, the complexity of the funding system. It's a nightmare. And I say this as a kind of new, new American with a kind of high school junior. It's, uh, it's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, complexity and opacity tends to be the friend of the upper middle class. It tends to be the friend of those with the education and resources to understand the complexity and navigate their way through it. So mm -hmm. if you, you kind of get to understand that the ACT is better than SAT for that school there, and if you play that sport and you apply there and you do that, and like, it's like eight-dimensional chess, <laughs> uh, this college admissions process in the US, right? And so if you know how to play it, you can really play with it. But for people who don't have those resources, they're looking at this system that's just bewildering, and you end up just going to the local place because that's where everyone else goes. And you end up with huge mm -hmm. undermatching problems. So the very complexity of the higher education system in the US is a problem, even before we get to the way it's financed mm -hmm. and the subsidies that go through various tax breaks to very, you know, very rich private institutions. Mm -hmm. um, I think that money would be much better spent on helping right. develop the human capital of those in the bottom 80% right. rather than the top 20%. Yeah. Um, I could ask you many questions about this. Uh, so, but I'm I'm just going to start with with one because you've talked about it so much, which is legacy um, legacy admissions. I mean, shouldn't they just be against the law? And do you think that there's a legal challenge that has any shot at that? There was a legal challenge, but it was a terrible challenge. <laughs> uh, it was by someone who probably wouldn't have got in anyway. Uh, out stay. <laughs> it was very complex. Uh, uh, there, are, there are legal scholars who, who, who really think a decent challenge would work. And there have been isolated cases. I think it was Texas A&M had to get rid of theirs mm -hmm. uh, on race grounds, actually. Um, because in practice, legacy preferences have significant racial consequences. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you have to think about it for two seconds to think why that would be the case. Um, and so there, is not, there are various uh, arguments about George, it. Hasn't, Georgetown has the obvious example. Georgetown's a very good example. Yeah, <laughs> Georgetown's now trying to correct that with the, um, the thing with uh, the, the slaves that built the college. Um, but it's very interesting, this, because it's quite a trivial issue in a way. And people like to say to me, well, that won't really change very much. It's not like a poor kid suddenly get that place or that, kid, or that person denied it. So it seems like it's quite tr trivial and symbolic. Well, in that case, if, if it really doesn't matter much, why not get rid of it? Uh, it seems to me you could turn the triviality objection on its head. Uh, and it seems to me it's a bit it's like a tip of the iceberg issue. It's a bit like a system that's not even pretending to be meritocratic. 
you know, if, you, if you're allowing a hereditary principle to operate in your admissions process, then it seems to me that all bets are off in terms of everything else. It's very hard to persuade people that their early admissions criteria or the way they do fund or merit aid mm -hmm. or the tax subsidies are unfair if they still think the legacy preferences are okay. So it seems to me that, you know, if I can't, if we can't at least agree that that's not a good idea, then lots of the other kind of much deeper reforms that are needed will, um, will be much harder to achieve. And candidly, also as a new American, it's a national embarrassment to have a hereditary principle uh, operating in college. I mean, it just really, it really, it really is. And people hate me for saying it, and it doesn't matter if you're liberal or right, but people just, this really gets people upset, I've discovered. This, mm -hmm. is, this, is a, this makes maybe even more unpopular than some of the other things I say. Um, <laughs> but I'm just like, uh, uh, really? Are we really going to say that that's OK? Because it, it, just, it should just go. It just, mm. just go. So, so to what degree does that, I mean, I mean, because I think about that, and I think about the schools that have legacy preferences. And I think about getting an education at those schools. And sure, they have a very high quality education, but they have a lot more than that, right? I mean, they have their networks. They have their alumni networks. And the other thing that you talk about, and it's so interesting, is sort of how, because uh, I hadn't really thought that much about it before, but how people are so attached, like almost this tribal attachment mm. to their alma mater and, yeah. where, and where they went yes. to school. And, 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 you know, I mean, is, is that part of it? And yeah. is that, and, and also surfacing that, is that part of what we should understand about the ways in which our education system is, is sort of perpetuating the, the divides rather than being a more American? Yeah, I think I mean, that's certainly one of the criticisms that I had, and I actually toned down the section on legacy preferences as a, as a result of uh, colleagues reading it. Um, uh, <laughs> so it's, that's the soft version. Um, and, I, and, I, and one of the things is that I, as a new American, I can't claim to fully understand the tribal loyalty that Americans feel to their colleges. The closest I can get is soccer teams in, in the UK. Um, you know, the stickers, the whatever. And so there's something to be said for like we're a Clemson family or kind of whatever, right? And so I, 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 and I don't, because I can't fully understand it, I think mm -hmm. it's important for me to sort of just put that out there and say, so I may be missing something quite important here. And you might say, look, we're private institutions. If private institutions want to operate a hereditary principle uh, and they think it will help alumni giving, which I don't think it does really, um, mm -hmm. might a bit, but I don't think it does very much. Or because it's important, Larry Summers said, it's important to the kind of institution we are. It adds to the, you know. What, what does that mean? Ask Larry. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but but uh, uh, something about like the feel of the, you know, what's, what did they say? Like we're creating the class. You know, they said we're kind of creating the freshman mm -hmm. class and it's a mixture of athletic ability and some legacies. And, you know, it's like we're, I'm like, you're not a, it's not a museum. Um, it's an educational institution. But if they're private institutions, you might say, you know what, private institution, if they want to do it, who are we to say? But it's not just private institutions that do it. It's public universities that do it too. And even the private institutions get very significant public subsidies. Mm -hmm. So that's tax dollars going from every right. working person in America to subsidize an institution that's operating a hereditary principle. So right. it does seem to me if you're fully private, great, go private, but you ain't getting another dollar out of us. Um, right now we've got a situation where we're subsidizing them to do it. So we, at the very least, let's stop, let's stop encouraging them. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so we've been talking about mostly higher education. But the education divides start uh, well before that. And then this is where we get into, I think, you know, some of the challenges we see in different, how, the, how, the, how just basically our class divides and so many of our social divides are different in different parts of the country, right? And, and there's the whole role of state and local government and, and mm. governing all of these kinds of things. But you have, um, you have many thoughts about this, but, but let's start with, start with education and then we'll go into housing, which is also where we're subsidizing. Uh, the rich at the expense of the not rich. So I'm, uh, I don't say very much about K-12 mm -hmm. education in the book, uh, and that's partly a recognition of just not knowing very much about it. But it's also an observation that it looks to me as if K-12 reform has been going on about as long as the K-12 <coughs> system has existed. I mean, there may have been a few minutes Pretty where much. you had a K-12 system, but it just doesn't feel like it's very long, right? Yeah. That, um, uh, and it's proved to be very difficult um, because there are massive vested interests involved. The system's structured in a particular way. Uh, obviously, there's it's, it's huge complexity in there. And so, as a, as a non-expert observer of that, I just say, look, and I look at it and I go, wow, that looks hard. Um, uh, so it doesn't say we shouldn't do some things, and we can we can talk about that, including I think paying good teachers, teaching poor kids, a lot more money. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, right. That sounds. Why not? People say you can't throw money at the problem. Maybe you can throw money at that one. Because okay. I think people will respond to incentives, and some evidence they will, even from quite small teacher incentive programs. So why not do that? But otherwise, I tend to think there's probably lower hanging fruit before K and after 12, mm -hmm. um, simply because the system's a bit more malleable, and they're not quite as stuck. 
Um, so I'm certainly not giving up on K-12 education. I certainly would like to see th those teachers being paid more and using market incentives. I'm not against more choice if that, mm -hmm. if that does break the system. You know, I think um, obviously that's a very controversial issue right now with the new administration. But my view is I look at the, so people say, oh, choice will create lots of inequality. And I say, well, what about now? Uh, you know, the counterfactual is pretty bad. So if we had this wonderfully egalitarian system now, then I might feel differently about messing with it. But it's, it's not a very egalitarian system right now. And so maybe some disruption around some, some <laughs> aspects of choice and more market-based things will do a better job of it. I'm agnostic mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. I just want to do things that will try to disrupt the equilibrium we have right now, whereby my kids in a public high school get great quality teachers because of where the school is. Um, and we know that quality teachers are the single most important thing. So. You know, you'll notice I haven't come up with any particular, particularly specific policy ideas, but that's because I'm just not expert enough to do yeah. so. Well, the, the policy idea I wanted to actually connect it to that you do talk a lot about in the book is, is, is zoning, because mm -hmm. most people choose their schools by where they buy their homes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so how do you think about ways we could rethink sort of where people are able to live in terms of giving them access to... to more egalitarian schools. Yeah, so they choose the school or the house. You know, it's interesting the way you frame it. Um, of course, what, are, what people do is they say, I, I want it to be in that I mean, it's, that what, it's, it's, it's what, what, we what do. people do. It's, it's, what what I I, it's what I did. Yeah. I was living in the yeah. district until I was going to have yeah. kids, and then I moved out to a different school system. Yeah. So. Um, yes, everyone. Sorry you know, everyone for people does in the district. Everyone yeah. does it. Ooh, yeah. now, 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 we'll get a lot of questions about that. And Maureen will now take to. questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's why we always. Have, that's why I, we have to be very careful about which stones we throw in this space, um, right? Because we do want our kids mm -hmm. to do well, and um, we don't tend to treat our own children as social policy interventions. And I think that that's gener generally quite right. Um, as a kind of parent, um, but I think that they appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's not quite. How I haven't put it to them quite that way. Um, you're not a social policy intervention. Um, it, the way that these, I think, really, it's the way these things all connect together. And so, if you have very significant housing wealth inequality that's subsidised through the mortgage interest deduction, and then you add into that some kind of quite quite a thicket of zoning ordinances in many cases around. You know, more affluent neighborhoods. And then you organize your schools based on mostly geographical areas, which means that you know, the kids are going to be from the affluent area that's protected by the zoning mm -hmm. and it's too expensive anyway. And then you subsidize it to the tune of $70 billion a year through the mortgage interest deduction. That's a pretty good looking system in terms of class perpetuation. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that some, some sort of you know, evil genius um, sat there and said, I'll tell you what, let's subsidize expensive mortgages. <laughs> then allow them to use local zoning to protect them. Then organize the school system based on ge geography. That should do the trick, right? Let's do that. I'm not saying that, ha ha. You, but, I, but I might suggest that if you were such an evil genius trying to come up with a system that would help the upper middle class to perpetuate its status, it might look a bit like that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I guess what I was really struggling with, and, and maybe you could say a little bit more about this, is, is, is regardless of how you got to this system, how do you unwind it, right? Because I feel like, you know, and there has been cases of, you know, other other school districts trying, you know, people trying to break off from Breaking a larger away. school oh, district. A I mean, right? Yeah. So, so, you know, so I, I feel like rather than unwinding it, we're kind of starting to double down on it. So how, how yeah. do you start to unwind Actually, it? you get these unintended consequences. So sometimes if you move too aggressively, for example, towards a more egalitarian integrated school system, you actually create an unintended consequence mm -hmm. of a district breaking away or of significant upper middle class flight away from it, which mm -hmm. actually makes the problem worse. And so I think that kind of as a policymaker, we have to kind of be aware of the need to sort of move uh, relatively slowly and in a way that kind of allows people time to adjust rather than sort of a dramatic, you know, over, overnight change in school admissions mm -hmm. criteria, for example. That's almost inevitably going to create some kind of, um, some kind of backlash. The issue around, around things like zoning and schools, because it's local and or state. You're starting to see more states now and cities taking the issue of housing affordability and the cost of land and zoning more seriously. I think conversation is changing in California, it's changing in Seattle, it's changing in Massachusetts, it's changing in New York. Now, whether those conversations will lead to more action, I don't know yet. But I, am, I do think that there's a, bit, there's a better bipartisan conversation around that now than there was, so I'm a bit more hopeful. But as for the other stuff, look, one of the great things about the U.S. is its localism. And it's kind of sense of kind of strong and it's strong local government, but also that has to be held in balance with other goods like the ability, economic mobility, economic opportunity, and to say that those values are in tension 
is a good thing to say because then we have to find ways to resolve that tension. But actually, I think part of my purpose here is just to try and, in a sense, get us to have a more honest conversation about the way in which, for example, right now there's a zoning debate going on in my neighborhood uh, and people are all saying it's about environmental stuff, parking stuff, et cetera. Let's just flush it out a bit more because it's not just about that. Mm -hmm. It's also about something else. And some of it's about a class-based a class uh, debate, which I, I just want to have a more honest debate about that. Great. So some of the other things, so, so I have a couple other of your solution set that are in there. And, um, you know, so part of it is before you even get to K-12. So, um, I, so maybe you could just say a word about why sort of the um, home visiting caught, caught you. And then there's, um, you spend a fair bit of time talking about it before you even have children. So maybe you could talk about some of sure. your thoughts on those as well. Both. So uh, home visiting, uh, I'm a pretty enth enthusiastic supporter of home visiting programs. Uh, I think the evidence of their effectiveness is, is good. Uh, we're waiting for uh, some more trials to come in now, but I think it's better, for example, than some of the evidence on pre-K education. Um, people will disagree about that, but um, and actually those early years, like pre-pre-K, uh, you know, pre-K is really late uh, in terms of development. Uh, and there are a lot of families and kind of parents that actually do benefit from the support the home visiting around, you know, child development, mm -hmm. around having parents read to their kids, around nutrition and so on. And there's a real squeamishness about that, particularly in the U.S., where I'm just like, that's for parents. That's a private matter, mm -hmm. right? Uh, nothing to do with you and this whole idea of, you know, Uncle Sam telling you to give your kids more broccoli or whatever. And so I understand that squeamishness. But on the other hand, the people who lose out from that squeamishness tend to be the kids uh, who are in lower income mm -hmm. communities and families. And that seems to me to be too high a price to pay to avoid our own discomfort about the conversation. So I'm hoping, I think the reauthorization for federal support for home visiting comes up mm -hmm. next year. It got bipartisan support last time uh, through the congressional reauthorization. Let's see what happens. Um, uh, I think it's a kind of test of the new Congress, but I'm, it seems to me that it's very evidence-based. It's a great, and I could talk a great length. I think it's a, a, a good example of federal policy making. It's very decentralized, et cetera. Um, and why not? And can you, because you mentioned in, the, in your book that you had home visiting when you had your kids in the UK. It's universal which, in which the UK. Is, yeah. I didn't know that. It was yeah, in, yeah. Every, everybody gets a health visitor. It's just, it's just in, it's a, back to social norms, yeah. right? It's the norm, um, is that you're new parents, you know, and, they, and the, the health visitors are pretending to weigh the baby. Mm -hmm. They're actually chatting to you about how you're getting on. We discovered years ago that actually weighing the baby was pointless. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the health physicist can tell immediately if there's a nourishment issue. They don't need to weigh the baby. But you have a baby and you have these charts that you kind of fill out and it's, you know, what percentile you're on. It's, it's nonsense. Uh, it's really complete. It's a waste of their time. But the health is so the government wanted to get rid of it. They want to say, let's stop weighing the babies. And the health physicist all said, no, no, no. That's part of the ritual of it. And while we're doing it, we're saying, we're weighing a baby. And then we say, and how are you getting on? You know, how's the breastfeeding going? How's dad doing with it? How's the sleep? You know, how's the verb? Whatever, just chatting. And it actually just brought out a lot, of, you know, it, was, it mm -hmm. brought out a lot of issues. And, and it's standard. Everybody has a health visitor come to them. And I think it's saying in the book, I saw them as angel, visiting angels. You know, I'd burst into tears when they arrived. <laughs> you were sleeping, <laughs> I was, huh? I'm so exhausted. Like, Thank God you're here. Um, so but there's a bit of, there's a different culture in the US. And then the other one um, is unintended pregnancy, um, which I do talk about at some length. And that's because I work with Isabel Sawhill. Um, who has a whole book on this. <laughs> and as I basically uh, strongly endorse Bell's uh, views on this, mm -hmm. which are that um, access to effective, uh, safe uh, contraception is a, is a very important part of the story of economic opportunity. They tend to be treated as separate things. We talk about economic opportunity as one thing, and then all the yucky stuff about family health and sex and all that, mm -hmm. and bodies are over there for other people to deal with. We'll, you know, we'll, do, our, we'll do the quintiles, you do the yucky stuff. Um, but, uh, and of course, it's a very, very difficult issue politically and normatively, and particularly in the history of race uh, in the US. It's, a, it's an incredibly sensitive issue. But nonetheless, the evidence that there are these huge class gaps uh, in the ability to access effective contraception and in rates of unintended pregnancy and unintended births, and the implications of that for the economic security and prospects of the mother, the father, and the child are overwhelming. Uh, and so it just it feels to me, this is, a, this is a space in w where the U.S. is a laggard internationally. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got the best smartphones in the world, but some of the worst contraception, uh, uh, availability of contraception in the world. That's, that's, that sort of feels like, again, that should be a space we should make more progress. However, it doesn't look like that's the way things are going. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to come um, uh, to all of you. Uh, we've got a great room here, and I'm sure there's a ton of questions out here. Um, but, but on this question of race, and I, I mean, you do sort of touch on it in your, in your book, and 
Um, it, it's certainly something that uh, we in this country have struggled with um, quite, a, quite a bit. And, and you know, I'm just, um, I'm, I just was wondering if you could just say a word or two about sort of both the role you see race has, uh, having played in terms of the divides we have right now, and, and also if there's anything that, um, you, you know, is sort of what you would think of as the forward look as ideas mm. going forward. That's great. So this book is about class uh, mm -hmm. almost exclusively, not about race. I mentioned right. it slightly. Um, I do... Uh, I have done quite a bit of work on race, and particularly in the context of economic mobility, you can't mm -hmm. not um, do quite a bit of work on race, because particularly the uh, mobility patterns for African Americans mm -hmm. are so very different um, to other Americans mm -hmm. that you actually can't understand what's happening without looking at um, what's happened to black mobility rates. Um, in this context, though, I actually think that the, in some ways we need, to have, we need to find a way to have a conversation about class and race and the way that they, they overlap. Um, I won't say intersect because that gets people upset. Um, but there is something, what's true about the intersectionality debate is that kind of you do need to be able to think about both at the same time. I will say that some of the, the institutions that are now operating, I think, in a way to perpetuate class inequality have their roots in uh, racist policies. So we talked a lot about housing and zoning. Mm -hmm. uh, the legacy of the mm -hmm. deliberate exclusion of black Americans in particular from housing wealth is right. massive to this day. And now it's not so explicitly racist. Right? Now it's, but it's used in a way that has massive income and class consequences, and therefore race. Same with legacy preferences. You, no US college had legacy preferences at the beginning of the 20th century. They introduced them because so many Jewish students were getting into the Ivy Leagues. Uh, and so as a series of measures to try and stop so many Jews from getting in, the Ivy Leagues introduced legacy preferences, which at a stroke massively cut the numbers because none of them had parents that had been there. It's actually a brilliant move if you think about it. Um, and, then it and, and, and then here we are. Now, none of them use it now in an explicitly anti-Semitic way, um, but it operates to have mm -hmm. these kind of class. So I think actually the way that the stories of race and class, and we, both in terms of the institution, really matter. The last thing I'll say is that the upper middle class is overwhelmingly white. It is less white than it was 40 years ago. I'm now talking about the top 20% of the income distribution. Less white than it was because it's a bit more Asian. Uh, there isn't, hasn't been a significant increase in the number of black Americans mm -hmm. or Hispanic Americans. Perhaps it's too early for Hispanic Americans because we've seen big immigration into that top 20%. But actually, by comparison to the general population, the upper middle class is whiter than it was because the population has mm -hmm. become more diverse. And that's an age effect and there's lots going on there and so on. Um, but we have, the, the story, I think, is we haven't seen really in the last 40 years a significant increase in the number of black Americans in that top 20%. Some and you know, people will talk about them, but actually there hasn't been very much uh, movement up there. It remains overwhelmingly white and now a bit Asian. Great, great. So now I, I get to bring all of you into the conversation. Um, we do have a couple of people with microphones, uh, so if people could just uh, raise their hands if they have questions, and we have some questions down here, uh, down in the front. And, and I see that there are, there is a woman in the back behind the pole, but I do see you, so. Um, uh, great, yes. Thanks. Um, I'm uh, Peggy Orchowski. I'm a congressional correspondent for the Hispanic Outlook on Higher Education. I'm doing a little article on your book. So I found it interesting that you said uh, that you did not see any, uh, there was something about difference on, between race and um, opportunity hoarding. But, and you said there was, oh no, you said there was no replacement of class for race in college admissions. But I would think, because there's a lot of anecdotal in, uh, evidence, that there are many Latinos and blacks who are in the upper middle class who do opportunity hoarding as well. So I wondered if you would comment on that. Which one at a time? Uh, well, I don't, first of all, I don't think there are that, that many, as I just said. There hasn't been that big an increase in the number uh, who are... Okay, so that's one. Um, a very high-profile one, to be sure. Um, but if we work with kind of bigger data sets and sample sizes, um, there has been a slight increase in the number of Hispanic and um, black Americans in that, in that top quintile, but it's small. I don't have the numbers... Uh, to hand, but, but it's, it's really very modest. Um, but there are some. So then the question is, is it okay if they opportunity hoard, given the other discrimination that they face and, and so on? That's a really difficult question. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and I, I, don't, I don't have a very good answer to it, but um, I think, it, uh, but uh, as you raised President Obama, he himself has said that he doesn't think his daughters 
need the extra help that, they are, that they will get from affirmative action policies and that we need to take class more seriously. I think one of the reasons people worry about the affirmative action debate and moving towards more class-based is they think it will, get, it will get rid of some of the affirmative action that's in place right now. Um, it seems to me that there's no reason why you couldn't move towards uh, you know, more, more class-based affirmative action, policy, if you want to call it that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and a lot of places are doing it, but they're doing it quietly. Uh, and that over time, that will change the nature of the debate. We don't have to stop doing one thing to start doing another one, not least because they overlap so strongly right now anyway. Um, and I think that's what, that's what the president was getting at. Yeah. And there in, in the highs. Discrepancies do you see between uh, urban versus rural, uh, as well as regional, Midwest versus South versus Northeast versus West? A discrepancy in what, in what particular aspect? The hoarding of, uh, okay. you know. Well, there are massive differences in intergenerational mobility rates, different areas. We know that from the work of Raj Chetty and his colleagues at the Equality of Opportunity Project, which has really changed our understanding of the different, and you see much lower mobility rates in the south and to some extent in the Rust Belt than in other areas, particularly low mobility rates in areas that have very large black populations, um, so that's part of the story, too, which we just kind of referred to earlier. The, the geography of the upper middle class is quite coastal anyway, you know, almost by definition, thinking about the incomes and where the kind of growth is and so on. So it, it tends to be more clustered on the coast. doesn't mean that there aren't people, even in the top 20% of national distribution in rural areas and smaller towns. But I'm just about to, do, about to produce a map on this. If you, if you want to map uh, the upper middle class and map the opportunity levels, they're pretty coastal. Uh, and that applies to something like zoning, which Maureen's asked about. You know, the most intensively zoned cities are the liberal cities on the coast. Uh, it's New York, LA, um, Seattle, San Francisco. Um, that kind of quite strongly upper middle class in their, uh, in their income and educational profile, but also very, very marked by these exclusionary zoning policies that I mentioned before. And so I think that if I was looking for the hoarders, it would probably be towards the coast. Um, but as I say, I'd have, I need to complete a bit of work to answer the question properly. Uh, this gentleman right here. Oh, and I'll come to you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the talk about the top 20 percent, um, it's to me, it seems very significant that that, that the top 20 percent you're talking about that has risen in the last half century or a few decades also is, there's been <laughs> certainly a lot of talk about, is the, has become the core of the what is, is normally thought of as the prog- progressive uh, democratic, uh, heart of the democratic coalition. And in my mind, that has also, well, I guess this is a matter of some controversy, also changed with the, re- the redefinition of progressive politics in many people's minds toward a much less class-oriented and more identity politics-oriented, all of which is being debated right now in, in often quite acrimonious terms. Do you, how do you see... You know, is this cause effect? Is it how, how does this interact? Because when, because many of the things you're talking about are in many ways against the grain of how people think about progressive issues uh, or have come to think about progressive issues. And obviously, the recent election has kind of thrown, sort of blown everything up in that regard. It's a great, it's a great question. Um, I think that. Well, certainly you only have to look briefly at the history of the Democratic Party, which I have only looked at briefly, to see that you did see this shift in the 70s after, I think, the McGovern Commission, um, which weakened the role of trade unions in particular, um, to see a kind of trend towards the professionalization, much more domination of the upper middle class uh, in the Democratic Party, uh, at least as much as in the Republican Party. The question is, does that matter? And what has the result of that been? I, I worry a bit about this debate about moving away from the identity politics towards class. And I worry about it because in our haste falling over ourselves to understand the white working class, there's a danger that we kind of forget that actually the people who face the steepest challenges in the U.S. remain uh, Americans of color, and particularly black and Hispanic Americans. That did not change. Um, and so, you know, you saw particularly close Ferguson and Baltimore and so on, I think a growing interest in issues of kind of race. And I will plug right now a new Brookings project run by a new colleague, Camille Bousset, on race, place, and economic mobility, which will specifically look at those issues. So I'm worried about the move. If it brings up a, a more of an awareness around class and our own class, the upper middle class, um, uh, and thinking a bit about some of the issues that we've just talked about, then I think that will be welcome. 
Uh, I don't, but I don't want it to be so narrowly about just let's understand the white working class. What do they need? What can we do for them? Why do they, why do they vote the way they did? You know, there's a, I, I think I'm now on eight working groups that could all be sort of subtitled, what the hell just happened? <laughs> uh, they have better titles than that. They're called the working group on progressive uh, policies for the working class, or whatever, right? But they're all really, what the hell just happened? Um, uh, and so all of that, but actually what I hope will happen is a moment of introspection as well, which is saying, look, Actually, there's quite a lot of us that have been on the winning side, economically speaking. Um, some of the ways that we've insulated ourselves from the risks that are faced by other Americans, black, white, and Hispanic, uh, can look at us and they can say, they seem to be doing quite well. They don't seem to be affected very strongly by trade or immigration. They're not being Ubered out of their jobs. Their kids are going to college. They, 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 hold on. <laughs> um, and to the extent that, that you can capture that, I think that there's some justification to people sort of seeing us. Not, that, not to say we're not doing lots of great stuff and all the rest of it. Shouldn't be too self-flagellating about it. But nonetheless, I think that the class gap is being refracted in very unpredictable ways in politics right now. Politics has become quite kaleidoscopic. Uh, you don't really know what's going to happen next. Uh, and I do, but I do think that the class debate, if it's held in that broader way, which includes us in it, and it's not just what can we do for the white working class, then that would be welcome as long as it doesn't mean all that identity politics stuff about race didn't work because we have stubborn, structural, deep problems around racial inequality in the US. But I want to, I want to pick up on one of the threads in this about, about work, right? Because I think that we've also had, you know, since the 70s, 80s, this, this sense of like to get a good job, you have to go to college, right? And you have to go to a four-year college and you have yeah. to get the kind of job that requires a four-year college, which is actually not very many of our jobs. Yeah. So, and we haven't really sort of um, maintained the same sense of value about the kinds of work that many, many people do and will do in their, in their careers in terms of caregiving work and food service work and other kinds of work. So. Yeah. So talk about that a little bit, sort of the, the not valuing the, the work that the working class traditionally yeah. did. I'm very, I'm very torn about this. So I worry a lot about the kind of singular focus on four-year college degrees. I worry a lot about that. Um, because clearly there are other pathways. Clearly we need more pluralism. Clearly you need more higher quality two-year degrees and vocational training and so on. That's clearly a problem. And it becomes a particular problem when you create a market, because it's you know, a market system in post-secondary education, you can sell this idea to people, and you can sell them a pretty shoddy education, quite expensively. Um, uh, you only have to look at some of the advertising that's, that's, that, that runs, right? It's targeting people, which is, if you want to achieve the American dream, you need a four-year college degree. So come to my fill-in college. Mm -hmm. It'll only cost you X, and I'll lend you the money an interest rate of just 15%, but if you default, it'll be 20%. And by the way, it's a pretty useless degree anyway, right. um, but you know you need it, and so you've got actually potential for a new subprime market mm -hmm. where you sell an element of the American dream. In this case, college education, it was a house, uh, and in a way that's quite predatory in some cases, and you really stuff people over rather than just getting a good quality two-year vocational degree. However, my fear about this is if I don't want to take any of the gas off all the efforts to open up four-year colleges and selective four-year colleges to a broader group of people. And so my fear, and I can't remember who, who always does this, it says, when we talk about vocational degrees, community college, how many of us are talking about our own kids? Right? H hands up, who's that, is that, you know, and actually what we're very often doing is we're talking about other people's kids. So when we say college isn't for everyone, what we mean is, college isn't for your kids. <laughs> of course it's still for my kids. What a, you think I'm crazy? I've looked at the charts. And so I, I do worry a bit about that second round effect from it. So I'm all in on high quality vocational and alternative routes and so on. But I don't want that to become inadvertently a way in which we just further bifurcate the market. So if we can do that without taking any of the pressure off the four-year system to open their doors, great. My fear is that it'll be like, yeah, yeah, college for our kids, vocational for your kids. Mm -hmm. I just worry a bit about that. Okay. Um, I'm going to go over here, and then over here, and then back over here. So, so I'm very confused about whether this 20% is a fixed line, or in fact, you can get, you know, the goal would be, on at least even on the part of the 20%, to have 30, the top 30, the top 40. That, that, and I think it's sort of reflected in, I think, the, the last person's point. That is, I was a Sanders delegate. But it seemed to me that a lot of people who were Sanders delegates, especially the older people, were in that 20%. And what did we want? We want single payer. 
And uh, in fact, the, mo the if you look at you know the nine or the ten most highly educated congressional districts, they're all they're all Democratic, and and arguably we'd be much better off if Trump uh, if we allowed Trump to pursue his uh, really attack poor people and stuff like that. Yeah. So um, the top twenty percent broke for Clinton uh, in the election in a break from the historical trend. So the historical trend is among the top 20%, it usually is rough, roughly breaks, it's roughly 50-50 Democrat-Republican. It broke more Democrat, according to the national, uh, the national election study. Um, so I think that's, that supports your point, which is that actually there are a number of people in the upper middle class um, who are pretty liberal, who are willing to vote for policies that that would redistribute, that would actually, on the face of it, um, hurt, some of, hurt some of themselves. There aren't enough of them. Um, we need more of them, for sure. Uh, and they control the kind of persuasive infrastructure around think tanks and journalism and kind of so on. But the only thing I would say is that some of those, so the liberal upper middle class people, I, I think some of I don't want to assume this, but may include some people we've talked about. They, always, they see inequality as a very distant issue. It will be solved by, you know, government voting for the right government once every four years or every two years. Um, and to that extent, they sometimes like subcontract their liberalism to quite distant institutions and to occasional elections. I think where conservatives are sometimes right about this is actually in day-to-day -day life, and it's in kind of sometimes sort of less glamorous, but but actually in some ways more important uh, battles like how integrated is your school. Uh, what's happening to your own neighbourhood? How does your organisation hire its interns, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Much less glamorous, but actually, just doing that work in day-to-day -day life um, in my quite almost community organised type way mm -hmm. is actually where they're not so good. And so, to put it at its sharpest, I sometimes fear that upper middle class liberals in America do just vote the right way, feel pretty good about themselves, and then don't do very much else. Um, and that's not good enough anymore because we need to change social norms. We need to change the political environment. This is a, we need a culture change that precedes any political change, which precedes any policy change. And that culture change will be led by precisely those people, but it won't be led by them doing it every four years. It will be led by the way they're conducting themselves as Cohen says in the thick of everyday life. So that would be my challenge back to them. Maybe being unfair to many of them, but that would be my challenge to them. Great. Uh, Ray? I'm a, a Latino who's not consciously opportunity hoarding. <laughs> but I will say uh, I worked very, very hard to become a member of the detached, clueless coastal elite. It wasn't easy uh, <laughs> getting in. Um, millions of American kids go to schools that are funded by their parents' real estate taxes. And every time a member of the class that you're writing about in your book says, oh, more money for education, money doesn't matter. These are people who often tax themselves formidably to send their kids to Mamaroneck High in Westchester and New Trier in uh, northern Cook County and um, Oak Park River Forest in Cook County as well and schools in northern Virginia and places like Falls Church. So if money didn't really matter, uh, they wouldn't have a lab where you could split the atom in the basement of their high school uh, chemistry area. <laughs> but it, uh, I think, uh, revealingly, every time you try to introduce a statewide formula to equalize those levels, it's dubbed a Robin Hood law, uh, because you're robbing from the rich to give to the poor. Uh, obviously, rich people already have convinced themselves that money does matter in education. Um, it just doesn't matter in, in those other kids' educations, apparently. Hmm. So many years ago, Gary Burtless, sitting three to your left, uh, edited a book called Does Money Matter? Uh, in education. How long ago was that, Gary? 20 years ago. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, lo a long-standing uh, debate. But I think, you're, I think you're sort of the force of your argument being, if it doesn't matter, why... If it really didn't matter why, he was spending so much money. Well, I think two things. One is we don't leave anything to chance. Part to this point, back to the stakes. You know, even if only, only, even it only matters a bit, people are willing to pay for it. You know, so I know people who kind of live, in, live next to some of the best public high schools in the country who send their kids to an incredibly expensive private school mm -hmm. you know, at a cost of 
$100,000 a year per child. And we look at the chart, I get the charts out and look at the outcomes. And I'm like, are you sure that that's worth that? <laughs> you know, I mean, are you absolutely certain that moving your kid from a school that's on the 93rd percentile to one that's on the 95th percentile in terms of test, is that worth $100,000? What surprised me is someone said, absolutely. Uh, I'll take it, two percentiles for like 100,000. Well, well, I won't. Sorry, <laughs> sorry kids. Um, so, but the question I think, like, where, why does money matter and where does it matter? I think that's the better conversation. And I think it kind of matters if it allows you to, if it allows you to attract quality teachers. We know that the quality of the person in front of the class uh, and the work that they're doing is like, that's almost ob so obvious that Harley needs to say it's hugely significant. And so if money is part of it, I don't know if money is much of the, of the issue there about attracting those teachers. I think it's other issues around those schools. If it's around some of the peripatetic supports that enable you to get into college more easily, for example, so counseling services, it really strikes that private schools seem to have, they have bigger counseling departments than my kid's school has math department. Um, mm -hmm. And that's because the counselors know the colleges, they get on the phone to them, they advise them, they help them, even if parents don't. They navigate the complexity for those kids. Uh, and they're able to pick up the phone. Uh, and so then, then I know what you're paying for, because that might be the difference in your kid getting into that college and that college, which again, people will pay almost anything for because the stakes are so high. So if it's through those sorts of services, so I'd, but we need to break it down and say kind of where does the money matter um, if we're to make any progress. But I agree about the politics of this. As soon as you start trying to equalize it, the problem we've got now is we've got the federal money, which is going, it's supposed to be extra money for poor kids. All it actually does is equalize, try to equalize. Uh, I know, and I think he's uh, now a non-resident, non but Arnie Duncan was very strong on that, which is just, mm -hmm. this, the idea of this money is to give poor kids more, but all it does is plug the gap because of the funding gaps that, you, um, that you've just referred to. Yeah, and the off-book funding gaps make it even worse. Well, the CAP just had a great report on PTA funding, mm -hmm. which I talk a bit about in the book. Yeah. Uh, yes? You've conflated income with class, but how do you separate out a technical knowledge worker like a nurse anesthetist versus a liberal arts knowledge worker like a college professor. Because you use the example of Georgetown University. At their hospital, the, nurse, the, the staff nurse anesthetist probably makes more money than 95% of the professors. But everyone in this room would put the professor in a higher class than the nurse anesthetist. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a great question. So there's, it's a very, um, so, so for part of my argument, I do, I use income breaks, you're quite right. Uh, and that is about as crude a measure of class as you could probably get. Um, I start with that because I want to see what's happening economically. Um, but I think that a more uh, sophisticated uh, description would include a, a level of education, uh, including college education, not least because even if that doesn't necessarily translate into the income, for the reasons you might have identified, it does translate into more security. It tends to find more power at work and it perpetuates itself incredibly powerfully across generations. So, so actually educational, inheritance of educational status is stronger than of income or wealth status. And so even if you've got some of these kind of parents are kind of lower income, it does, so that's, so education becomes an incredibly important class transmission mechanism. The boring answer is that most of the data sets I use to do the analysis of economic trends don't allow you to look at both education and income at the same time. But in the work I'm about to do geographically, I'm, I'm gonna try and do that. But I think it's a fair criticism to just say, look, that's not the same. You can look at two people on the same income level and they're not the same class. Um, and so I think it's a useful corrective to the way that I've put it. Thank you. Okay. This gentleman here and then in the back. Richard, Josh Zumbrin from the Wall Street Journal. I was wondering if you could discuss an alternate approach that's been taken to this issue, which is the one by Stephen Rose, where he defines the upper middle class uh, based off reaching an income level. So he's done work where he defines it as people earning over $100,000 uh, on an inflation-adjusted basis, which allows for the possibility that the upper middle class can grow and shrink over time. Mm. And he finds that the upper middle class has gotten a lot larger over the past 30 years, grown by something like 50%. And so I'm curious if you think that a lot of these issues, um, you, you, present, you often kind of present them as very zero sum, but if in fact the upper middle class is expanding significantly, uh -huh. does it cast a lot of these issues in a different light in terms of whether or not they're all hoarding behave, behavior? Could they, abs could they actually be you know, behaviors that have allowed the middle class to grow? I'm curious, I'm okay. curious why you think your approach is, is right and Stevens, which has very different conclusions and takeaways, um, is the wrong way to look at the issue. So I would not say that Stevens' approach is the wrong way. Uh, that's, that's for sure. It's a different way. And then you could, have, you could have asked about the way that Pew do it, which is different again, which is based around the median. 
So it's a certain percentage uh, distance from, from the median, and you get different results again. Uh, so I think as long as, you, as long as you're clear what your definition is and why that's your definition, that's okay. Um, the reason that I take top 20%, which is necessarily zero sum, um, is because of a, um, a moral claim that a fair society is one in which you have relative, quite high levels of relative mobility. So I would trade less growth in the size of the upper middle class defined uh, as Steve does for more mobility. He would go the other way. He'd say, look, I'm not really worried if people are moving up and down. I just want more people doing well. Um, I think the problem with his approach, there are many problems with my approach, some of which you've just uh, articulated and you have in your, your writing too. Um, it, the problem with his approach is that it's, it's hard then to see the line between a society getting more affluent and a society that's kind of you're seeing high levels of absolute mobility and just kind of general economic growth, which other things equal tend to increase the size of the upper middle class if you've defined it by a particular income cutoff. So if you say that's the line, as your society as your society gets richer, more and more people are going to be on the other side of that line. Well, that's an almost arithmetic result of economic growth. Um, which doesn't say it isn't important. It's just to say it's answering a different question, and it might have quite important policy significance. It might start to make, then you might just double down on kind of what are the motives of growth and not worry so much about my stuff, right, about moving up and down. You're just like, how do we, how do we just get the engine of growth going more? Because that will increase the size of the upper middle class, as Stephen defines it. Um, so I don't, think, well, I don't think one is wrong or right, but what I like about Stephen is he's very clear <laughs> that that's why he defines it that way. Uh, I define it differently, and it matters, because it might mean that at the margins you would go for slightly different policy solutions, particularly when it comes, for example, growth versus distribution. Uh, I think Steve's would lead you to a much more growth-oriented approach. Um, what I like about his approach is it allows you to look at certain cities, and my colleagues at Metro have just done this now. You can see the shrinking middle class. But the question is, why is the middle class shrinking? Right? By his definition, it can, go, it can be shrinking because a lot of people become upper middle class. Right? Mm -hmm. Yay! Most people say, good. Right? Or, in other cities, the middle class is shrinking because more people are becoming working class. Uh, and so you can, have a, you can have two cities with exactly the same shrinkage of their middle class for co almost completely the opposite reason. One of which is they're in real, real doo-doo. The factory closed and everyone's poor now. Uh, so they've fallen out in the middle class. And the other one because, hey, the tech company opened and everyone's upper middle class now. And so you do need to add that nuance um, to that approach because you need to figure out why that, where that's happened. The advantage of my approach is it's just, it's always fixed, right? There's only, you can only ever fit a fifth of the population in the top 20%. That doesn't change. Great. I'm going to take a few questions. So I'm going to go uh, one, two, three, and did I see one on this? And then we'll and then we'll wrap up. Um, will you remember some, them? Mark, yeah. Great. Help me to remember them. Uh, I will help you to remember them. Got pen Mark Popovich with the Aspen Institute. Um, appreciate the discussion and uh, pulling out the social norms and how they need to be addressed. I was wondering about one aspect of that, which is norms within the business community. I mean, if we take a, so if you look at the percentage of GDP over the last couple of decades that goes to profits to business, it's gone up 4%. The percentage of GDP that's gone to pay to workers has gone down by 4%. Different people justify that for different reasons. But certainly the earning, the asset owning class is the top 20%. It's concentrated there. So they benefited from that and most of the, has gone. So part of that is about policy decisions and changes in the economy. Part of that is changing norms in the business community as this social compact has shifted risk off of businesses onto workers. So have you thought about that and thought about prescriptions for addressing that as part of this issue? Okay, so we're going to hold a declining labor share of income and business norms. And I, I, I'm right here. Yeah, there. Hi, um, Ryan Bandari. I'm an economic policy advisor at Third Way. I was wondering if I could just give you a comment about uh, intergenerational mobility and income inequality and get your thoughts on it. And that is that my suspicion would be that much of the uh, upper middle class, liberal, elite group of people would be, you know, kind of building on what the gentleman over there who worked for Sanders said earlier, that they would be willing to pay more in taxes for things like TANF and food stamps and maybe even uh, more subsidized health care. But then if you were to flip it and go over and start asking them about, you know, zoning laws and, like, will you, will you ease up these zoning laws to let more poor children into your schools that your children go to or give up some other advantage through SAT tutoring or whatever it might be, they would be very 
taken aback by it. And I'm curious your thoughts on that and almost if we would prefer as a society the flip side, would be more willing to open up opportunity even if they're less willing to give up more money. So that seems like a question about sort of support for general transfers, but uh, kind of a prevalent mm. NIMBYism, I think. Mm. Um, and then there was one more, I think, over here. Uh, hi. So there was a passage in your book, if I remember correctly, um, where you talked about some of the social norms around internships and um, around using like family connections uh, to acquire internships. And that's something I've noticed personally too. Like there's a lot of people who, because I've thought about some of these same things and had these conversations and, and brought them up. And a lot of people will agree in principle, but they'll say, well, everyone else is using their connections to get an internship. So like that's what you should be doing too, because you have to try and, you know, like you have to try and do that so you're on a level playing field. And it just strikes me that it's pretty hard to change. It's kind of like a collective action thing. Like it's pretty hard to change behaviors um, if it's something everyone else is doing. Uh, so I was just wondering if you could kind of speak uh, to some of the social norms around that and, and how you think maybe that could, like what that shift would look like, how that would happen. Great question. Okay, so there you have it. So you've got uh, declining labor share and changing business norms, norms and the whole profit versus Probably wages thing. You've got the intergenerational. No, no, just, just tell me one at a time, otherwise I'll forget. Okay. All right, just one at a time. There you go. Go with that one. So, um, so I think you're right to say that actually quite often we assume it will be regulation or taxes that will change behavior in business, but I think you're right that very often it's about social norms. And you see very different outcomes for executive pay, for example, in different nations or at different periods in history. Um, not because of regulation, um, but because of something else. And I think that... One of the problems is the belief in meritocracy. Um, uh, and this is why I never thought I'd say I missed the British class system. But as I've said, you know, at least posh people in Britain have the decency to feel a bit guilty. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 that's, and that's a bit of a serious statement behind that, which is like, actually, you know, you're posh. That's why, that's why you're running the company, right? partly because you're posh. Or you've had these advantages. Okay? And so that kind of acts as a bit of a breaking mechanism and they're just hoovering up all the rewards for yourself. Whereas if you're in a society where you've convinced yourself, and you've convinced yourself individually and as a society, that your success can only be the result of your own brilliance and diligence, and that you deserve everything you get because of how awesome you are, then why not hoover it all up? And frankly, if the other people down there aren't doing as well, well, perhaps they're not as awesome as you are. Uh, so they don't deserve as much anyway. And so Michael Young warned about this in his book, The Rise of the Meritocracy, when he coined the term, which came to the US, and boy, did it flourish over here. His book was a warning about what would happen to a society that came to believe in meritocracy. And one of the things that would happen is the people at the top would start hoovering up more of the rewards because, hey, they deserve it. And they would start to feel more and more hard-hearted about the other people because it's like, well, you're just not very good. Um, and so I think that this part of the challenge of changing social norms is to challenge this idea that's so dear to Americans and which I love about America, which is a sense that everyone can make it and we live in a meritocracy. It would be lovely if it was true. Um, and I kind of don't want to give up on it. But on the other hand, I think it's doing a lot of damage now uh, to our political culture. And the second one? The second one was um, um, there's relative support for taxes to, you know, sort of taxes to help the poor people, but uh, we don't yes. actually want yeah. to let them in our neighborhood. So I think, I mean, I don't, I, to some extent, I'd sort of refer to my earlier answer about the difference between distant inequality fighting and, you know, in the thick of it, in the thick of everyday life, inequality fighting. Um, and I do think that liberals in the U.S. need to get better at the daily, in the thick of it, kind of inequality fighting, which will lead, I hope, to more support for the other policies, rather than this check, rather than to put it, you know, more bluntly than I intended, but I can check the box every four years, liberalism. Um, I'd be happy to pay higher taxes. My candidate didn't win. Anyway, back to dinner. <laughs> um, you know, and so, so I, I'm being unfair, but I, I do see a bit of that, and I think it's important we call ourselves out. But the other question was about the link between inequality and social mobility, and we nearly went the whole way, way without talking about the Great Gatsby curve, um, and the link between income inequality and mobility. My fear, actually, is that less mobility might lead to more income inequality, because if there's less mobility, and I feel like my kids are less at risk, I've got a glass floor underneath them, which even if they fall, not going to fall too far, um, my support for redistribution might decline. 
that will increase income inequality. Now, it's hard. I'm trying to find ways to look at that. But it might not be that inequality causes immobility. It might be that immobility changes incentives, which then result in less equality. So your, last, last one. your last one oh, was internships, internships family connect connections, and uh, do we have a collective action problem to get ourselves out of the We, we do. Property? It's a general. I think it's true of the others. It's true of some of the other things we do as well, which you get a lot of people. Well, everyone's doing it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You have an equilibrium where everyone's doing it. Um, and in equilibrium, everyone's doing it, it feels hard not to do it. But on the other hand, how do, we, how do equilibria change? Um, if everyone continues to do it because everyone's doing it, then everyone will keep doing it. And so it's a difficult thing. Some people need to stop doing it and start making a noise about it. Um, uh, and that will shift norms. That does shift norms. Internships, three and, three and five, graduating seniors have done them. They are handed out very often on a grace and favor basis. They are, to quote Charles Murray, affirmative action for the rich. You might not agree with everything Charles Murray said, but that I do agree with. Um, and Charles is on the back of my book. He was kind enough to blurb it. But I think that's true, that there is this kind of problem uh, with these informal labor market institutions. One of the hardest conversations I had was with my son, asking, him, asking me if I would give, get him an internship at my publisher, to which the answer was no. Uh, now, you might think, what a terrible parent. Um, but on the other hand, I know where my line is. Uh, I know that actually I will help him to be better educated, whatever, and I went down the same way. I've turned, if I get a funder who calls me at Brookings to see if I'll sort out an internship, God forbid this would happen, by the way. Um, <laughs> internship, I say no. Um, and, and you can gradually kind of shift norms around that a little bit. Um, but it will take some people to just stop doing it and make a little bit of a noise around it. Because in the end, same with legacy preferences, same with some of the other things we do, same with zoning, um, in the end, the argument that it's OK for me to do it even though it's bad because everyone's doing it is the moral reasoning of a sixth grader. Uh, you know, If my kid comes home to me and says, I cheated in math, but everyone was cheating in math, do I say, well, as long as everyone's cheating, <laughs> that's fine. I don't do that. And actually, as adults, I think we should try and live by the same standards. We should think something is an unfair and egregious practice. We think it should stop. Let's stop waiting for the collective action problem to solve itself and start trying to solve it one person at a time. And with that, join me in thanking Richard <laughs>